Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS, a show about building stuff with JavaScript. And today we're doing yet another proposal from you guys. This time around, it's going to be full-powered GraphQL backend with Next.js. As usual, I have live streamed the coding process, and if you're interested, the link is in the description. You can go ahead and have a look, as well as the link to the final repository where you can find all the source code and everything. So you know, go ahead and have a look at that. Now let's talk about the proposal first, right? So the proposal was to build a GraphQL backend and a frontend using Next.js and combine that somehow with MongoDB as a server. This is exactly what we did. And I won't stop on uh, Next.js because I already did a tutorial on that. So this video will basically be focused mostly on GraphQL. How do you plug it in? How do you set it up? How it works? And uh, just to walk through the code that I wrote, right? So let's start by talking about what GraphQL is. If you're not familiar, I guess you can guess from the name of the uh, project that GraphQL is a graph query language, which is exactly what it does. Um, it allows you to query uh, graphs of the data, but let me just uh, do a small side note. So if you have a real knowledge graph, like semantic knowledge graph, then GraphQL would probably not be enough uh, to properly query it. So there's no inference, there's no template variables, there's no things that are, for example, are in uh, Sparkle. So if you have a proper knowledge graph, you better look at some other language. On the other hand, uh, if you have a structured data that have a graph like structure that needs to be queried by the client, then GraphQL may be very fitting to what you do. It's a language developed within Facebook. So as you might imagine, it works really well for, uh, for example, social networks, right, when you need to query a post with a related data like users info and comments and uh, comments users and so on and so forth, right? This is exactly what it was made for. And uh, there's the graphql.org. There is a very good specification here, very good example. So if you want to learn it, go ahead and read through the docs. They are very well written and very easy to understand. I am not going to spend time doing that right now, but I'm going to walk you through the code and explain you um, basically how I understand the way it works, right? And um, yeah, so during the programming part, I basically built it using the Apollo GraphQL, which is one of the many frameworks available, it seems to be one of the most popular ones. It is very easy to use, especially the server side, client side, the react bit we used is a bit more complicated, but still quite easy. And it provides stuff like automated caching, and uh, access management and whatever you can imagine, it's like a full fledged GraphQL framework, right? So uh, this is what we used, it was like what we picked during the live stream. You don't have to use this, there's many others. So you can just go ahead and pick your own, but they work in a more or less the same way. Like the differences is basically on the framework level and uh, how do they work, right? So let's have a look at the code here. So here's our um, project. And as you can see, it's a Next.js project, right? So in dependencies, we have the Next.js, we have the React, obviously, we have Mongoose, because we did use MongoDB. And we use the MongoDB in memory. So I'm gonna say, Mongo start. So I'm going to start our MongoDB just to show you basically the way it works right now. And um, because we had to plug in the GraphQL server, I had to create my custom server for Next.js, right? So it's very simple, it uses Express.js and Apollo Server Express middleware. And all it does, this is actually the two lines that you need to set up the GraphQL server. That's all you need, literally. So all the magic happens in this schema part, which we're going to talk about right now. So I have this data folder here. And we have a schema. Um, so schema consists of two things. First of all, it's your type definitions. And second of all, it's your resolvers, right? So type definitions is uh, where you define types of the data, as well as queries and mutations that you'd allow. So data is obvious, this is your data, right? So in this case, we have author, which is the um, author object and we have a post which is a post object which has the author field which is linked to the author. And uh, we have queries, right, which is the way that you describe queries that are a user allowed to execute. So in this case, we have a query that finds author by the first name and last name, we have a post query that finds post by title. And we have all authors and all posts queries. Additionally, we have a mutation which is a um, the name for uh, changing the data using GraphQL. So in this case, we have two mutations, the first one is create author and the second one is create post. So in case in this case, we also define the inputs. So we have the author input, which takes the first name and last name. And we have the post input, which takes title text and author. Uh, in this case, it's int, which means it's author ID. And um, 
here we can say that we define this inputs and you see this exclamation mark means that it's mandatory. So the input has to be provided. And those mutations return the corresponding types, right? So very simple. Um, again, this this uh, this is sort of very linear structure. There's no complex complex stuff in here, but it basically shows what you can do with it, right? There are links from authors to post. There are links from post to author. There's basically insertion. There is um, in this case, okay, when we have creation, but it's really easy to implement deletion as well. So, but this only defines the schema, right? So how do you actually execute all of that? How does GraphQL understand what to do? Well, here is the part where the resolvers come in, right? So the idea is that all the things that we wrote in schema is actually a description of an object that is passed through resolvers. So you can think of all of those query and mutation functions as a real JavaScript function. So whenever you execute the GraphQL query, it will actually trigger these functions within the resolver. So if you see this, we have this author function. And this here, we have this query author JavaScript function, right? And it does exactly what you would expect. It takes the author, in this case, this is a MongoDB uh, schema, and it finds one author using the arguments passed to it. In this case, the arguments are first name and last name. So it's pretty trivial, right? Um, then we have all authors, which just finds all of them again using MongoDB and same goes for post and all posts, right? We have additional schemas for uh, or additional resolvers for to find all posts for a specific author and to find uh, author for a specific post, because this is required when we're going to ask for, you know, give me an author that has this post. So uh, GraphQL has to know how to resolve that and how to fetch the post for a specific author. This is exactly what happens here, right? Um, this is something that you actually have to keep in mind because since GraphQL will do all these resolutions and querying for you, that means that when you request more than a few authors and you ask for uh, like a bunch of posts for them, GraphQL will execute multiple queries in parallel to your database. You have to be very careful not to moderate your database and be sure to, you know, have enough resources uh, for it, allocated for it, right? Okay, now the same goes for mutations, actually. So you have the mutations. And the cool thing is that all of those functions support promises um, as a result, right? So you can return a promise, which works perfectly fine. And in here, in this case, you can see that here create author basically. Um, so in this case, I did a mistake, I used int for um, authors ID, which is fine, but it doesn't really work well with MongoDB. So I had to first count the number of authors and then uh, basically syntactically create or synthetically, this is the correct word, create the ID for it, which is, I guess, you know, if I would rewrite that code, I would remove that and use actually MongoDB IDs. But in this case, I was just like a workaround from it. So it basically creates a new author from the input. And with this calculated ID, saves it and returns the new object, right? The same goes for posts. So again, the same problem with ID because I didn't actually Think this through good enough. And uh, in this case as well, we need to link it to author. So we find the author by the given input ID and uh, link it via the mongoose ID. Again, if I would do that correctly, we would actually need to do this because we would use the ID of author uh, as in a string ID, right? So, and uh, that's actually it. So the cool thing is that in this case, we're using all those resolvers over one MongoDB, right? But the thing is that those resolvers don't really care what you use as long as you return the data that fits the described schema. So one thing you could do is you can have multiple databases that you can query with the same GraphQL endpoint. So for example, we could have authors in one database and then post in another one. And that would still work as long as we have like by multiple connections and have a correct resolvers that query that. Or maybe you have a data in a JSON file that you just load in memory and then some additional data in a distributed key value store or whatever. That still could work. And this is a really one of the cool features of the GraphQL that I really like um, personally. Okay, so this is basically it for the server side. This is all you actually have to know. So I'm gonna uh, start the server just to demonstrate that basically how the UI works. So the cool thing is that there's also um, graph IQL interface, which is created automatically. So uh, in the server JS, we set up the uh, GraphQL endpoint, which is the pure JSON endpoint. And we have GraphQL, uh, graph IQL endpoint, which is this UI that allows you to query things. And it also has the autocomplete actually. So you can actually um, run it 
interactively and check your data manually, basically, right? You can execute all the mutations and everything. All of that works here. That's pretty fine. There's autocomplete and you can see all the data. So right now we don't have any data. I am going to take our Robo Mongo, um, MongoDB UI and I'm just going to go into this database and go into authors and I'm going to insert one author just so that we have something to play with because um, to be honest, I forgot to do that. And uh, we need something to add posts to actually, right? So it's going to be ID one. I'm going to have a first name uh, test. I'm going to have a last name author, right? So nothing complicated, just insert that. Now we have one author here, there you go. And uh, if we now rerun this query, we would actually get ID. And uh, the cool thing is that if you hit, uh, hit control space here, you would actually get the auto suggestions for other stuff. So we can actually see, you know, query the first name and last name. And uh, we can obviously query just parts of it. And this is one of the coolest parts about the GraphQL that you can actually build the way that you want to see objects from the client. So the actually server will just return you what you want to see, saving you bandwidth, saving you resources and making it slightly easier for client to process. So you can actually directly bind the query results to the UI, which is really, really cool. Now let's talk about the UI bit. So um, all of that was server for now, right? So now we have to do a UI part. Well, in this case, I build a simple UI where we create a test post text, uh, set test post title, then we have a test post text, and we have author ID. So in this case, we have only one author. And uh, if you hit create now, you will see it immediately. This is also handled by the Apollo client. And um, the cool thing, so obviously if I refresh it, it will still persist. The cool thing is that it's um, quite easy to set up as well. So we have this index page, which basically just consists of a bunch of things. So we don't really need this with data here. Actually, no, we don't need this with data here. Uh, so this with data is a special wrapper that is required for um, Next.js. You might not need it in your uh, normal React app, but because Next.js is also uh, server-side rendered, right? You need a special wrapper that would basically decide whether we're on a server on a client and execute the data and inject it into component differently. Like normally, if you just run a client side rendering, this is the three lines that you would need, you get this Apollo provider. And that's basically it. But because we have server side rendering, there are some workarounds and this this bit of code here with data is taken directly from the next JS uh, repository examples with Apollo. So you know, you can uh, go have a look there. But basically, all it does is just um, fixes the server side rendering, right? Okay, so the init Apollo is also um, pretty straightforward. There's again some workarounds uh, because of the server side nature of the Next.js. But the idea is very simple. So basically you create a new client and again, we have some additional stuff here with, uh, re with regards to dev tools and server side rendering. Uh, we create in memory cache in this case, you can also create like persistent caching for browser and stuff like this. Did not uh, investigate this for this live stream. And then you just return this Apollo client, right? So very simple. This is then used in this with data wrapper. Now let's look how the components are actually created. So we got our app here, which is just a wrapper in which I included the Bulima to make it look slightly nicer, which is basically boring part. And now we have the post list. So this is actually what renders the post, right? Um, the way the component looks is super simple. So it's actually a plain or how do you call them? The simple components, right? The function components. They just use props to render everything. In this case, we destruct props into error and all posts. And if we have a, an error, we obviously show an error. If we have all posts, then we render the post. And if we have nothing, we just say that we're loading, uh, which is not exactly correct because I've seen if we have post length zero, then we actually show loading, which is not true. So this has to be slightly tweaked. Okay, so how do you actually execute? Well, you have this GQL uh, helper from uh, GraphQL tag package, and we have this GraphQL wrapper from React Apollo. And what we do is we create this GQL um, helper string, which is a query. So we get all the posts and for them we get ID, title, text, author. And for each author we get ID, first name and last name, right? So this will return a pretty complex structure with the posts and authors of each post. And then you just use the GraphQL function from Apollo to wrap the query and the component. And that's it. That's all I have to do. So on the changes, it will be re-triggered automatically, as you've seen that I, when I submitted the new post, it actually reloaded the post and got the new ones and re-rendered them immediately. So the post component is obviously boring as well. So there's nothing magical happening here. 
Okay, now let's talk about the submit part. So it's a bit more tricky, but still quite straightforward. First of all, we have the submit component, which is essentially a form with a bunch of input fields. So we have the title, text, and author ID. And then we have a handle submit function that essentially submits this form using our create post uh, function that is passed through props, as you can see here. Now we have the mutation query defined as before uh, with the normal query, right? And we have this create post function with um, dollar title, dollar text, and dollar author variables. So those are GraphQL variables that are defined by you. In this case, we call the internal create post GraphQL method with the input that is constructed from those variables, right? And we get back the uh, post with the author information filled in. Now let's talk about how do you pass in it to Apollo. So first of all, we pass the query, obviously. And second of all, we have to define this um, create post function, right? Because it doesn't exist. And this is our custom function because we need a custom input over here. This is exactly what we do. So you use the props field over here, you get the mutate from props. This is what the Apollo GraphQL typically passes. So you could, we could have used it here right away, but it's easier to create a function on top of it. And what the function does is basically calls mutate, right? Uh, so the mutate takes in an object with config and this variables thing is basically what is executed on server. And uh, secondly, we call this uh, or we add the update field, which is a special function that will be uh, executed upon the completion of the mutation to update our local cache. So as you can see here, we take the data which reads from this proxy and gets, uh, gets all the posts that we have right now. And we write to this proxy, we get the, uh, again, the same query, but we append our created post to the beginning of that data so that we actually have it immediately in the UI as you've seen uh, when I showed the example, right? So once again, pretty straightforward. All of that is in the React Apollo docs. So go ahead and read it for yourself. It's very, mm, I mean, I wouldn't call it complicated, but yeah, there's enough boilerplate here, but it's not hard to understand. That's what I want to say. And uh, that is basically about it. So as you've seen the, you know, the post creation is very straightforward. We have auto updates, we have the persistence, obviously, all of that loads and works perfectly fine. It is a very simple example. And obviously, you can do more complicated stuff. But I think we are at the stage where setting up and working with GraphQL is simple enough to make it viable for some things. So I, I would still say that um, rest interfaces would work uh, for like 90% of cases, but when you have a complex data structures uh, that are not yet knowledge graph, but already close to that, you might want to have a look at GraphQL. It is a very interesting technology. Um, another use case that I already mentioned might be the databases merging. So when you have multiple databases that have re related data, but are distributed, you might use GraphQL to actually merge them into one uh, endpoint. That's basically all I have to say about that. Uh, so this was the GraphQL backend with Next.js. Um, as usual, do not forget to vote on the next proposals that you like. Do not forget to submit the proposals if you have anything in mind. And yeah, thank you for watching. And as usual, I see you next time. Bye.